What does it mean to give something up to God, to really take something to the Lord in prayer? For the friends of a paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2, it meant physically picking up an adult male, carrying him up on a roof, and then tearing open that roof in order to lower him down to Jesus. This was not motive without action, a sentiment in want of effort. It was a dedicated act of faithfulness through which they hand-delivered their afflicted neighbor to the Lord. And in our study of Mark chapter 2, we're going to closely examine Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12, where we see how faithfulness to the master brings us freedom. And this is not only freedom from physical or spiritual bondage, but also through clarity of the mind. You see, the world really wants you to think on its terms. It wants you to use its vocabulary and only look at the issues that it sets before you. All idolatry and worldly thinking is in some way insane. But to love the gospel, to actually see and hear with the eyes and ears which God has set before us, to be transformed in the renewing of your mind, that will bring you freedom, a perfect liberty from all inescapable burdens which none can rob from you. Now, of course, these things, they are not easy. And as we come to Mark chapter 2, we find out when our faithfulness is directed towards the perfect faithfulness of Christ, when those two things meet together, there is goodness, there is truth, and there is beauty. And... Today, we'll be looking at all of Mark 2 and then coming back to examine those first 12 verses. So thank you for joining me. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. Let's open up in prayer and then we'll jump into Mark 2. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to come together. Lord, whether we be assembled in person or over the airways, I just pray that you open up our hearts and minds that we can have fellowship with one another that is directed towards you. Give us your strength, your wisdom. Let us be courageous men and women who reflect your image and your goodness and your truth. Lord, I lift up our world to you where everything seems to be muddled and riddled with chaos. Lord, let us look towards you and let us be a light in the darkness. And as we walk through the dark valley, give us great strength. Lord, let us have joy in all that we do. And even when those want to persecute us, let us have great joy in our lives. We ask all of this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So today, we'll be reading through all of Mark chapter 2, and the reason for that is quite simple. The gospel speaks for itself. Let the lion out of the cage. We need to put on the whole armor of God and have as much scripture wrapped around us as we can. And today, we'll read through it all, and then I'll come back and look particularly at those first 12 verses. So, without any further hesitation, let's jump right into Mark 2, shall we? The text reads, When Jesus came back to Capernaum a few days later, it was heard that he was at home. And many gathered together, and there were so many that there was no longer space, not even near the door. And Jesus was speaking the word to them. And then some people came, bringing to Jesus a man who was paralyzed, and four men carried him. And when they were unable to get to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above, and after digging an opening, they let down a mat on which the paralyzed man was lying. And Jesus, upon seeing their faith, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and thinking it over in their hearts. They said to themselves, Why does this man speak in this way? He is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins except for God alone? And immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit what they were thinking and saying within themselves, he turned to them and said, Why are you thinking about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to a paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus then turned to the paralyzed man and said, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And he got up and immediately picked up the mat that he was on, and he went out home in the sight of everyone. And all were amazed in glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. And he went out again, this time by the seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed Jesus. And it happened that he was reclining at the table at his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And there were many of them. And they were following Jesus. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? And upon hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. 
I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And then John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to Jesus, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, While the groom is with them, the attendants of the groom cannot fast, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the day will come when the groom is taken away from them, and then on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, and the new from the old, and the worst tear results. No one pulls new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins as well. Instead, one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. And it happened while Jesus was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath day, and he took his disciples, and they began to make their way along, picking the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to them, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was in need and his companions became hungry? How he entered into the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and he ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for anyone to eat except for the priest, and yet he also gave some to those who were with him. And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. And so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. All right, so we've read through Mark chapter 2, and there's a lot in that text, and it's just wonderful to let the gospel soak in. It is a lion. Let it out of the cage. In our world, we need to just be fortified in Scripture. Have as much of it under your belt as you can, and come back and just spend more and more time in it. You know, don't let the world assail against you without them first having to contend with the Holy Scriptures. And when we think about our own actions in the world around us, we often talk about giving things up to God, taking things to the Lord in prayer. But when we look at the context of Mark 2, You get something that's rather interesting because we might ask ourselves, what does it really mean to give something up to God, to take something to the Lord in prayer? For these friends of the paralyzed man there in Mark 2, it meant physically picking up an adult male, carrying him on a roof, and then tearing open that roof in order to lower him down to Jesus. This is anything but motive without action, anything other than a sentiment and want of effort. This is a dedicated act of faithfulness through which they hand-delivered their afflicted neighbor to the Lord. And today we can see how they were people of sound mind. They had that clarity of the gospel, which comes only from God. Through the Holy Spirit, we can be transformed. And that doesn't just mean that we have some aversion to sin or some special calm temperament. But it means we see the world differently. When the Holy Spirit comes to rest on us, it should change our eyes and ears that we see different things in the world. We're not so worried with peer pressure, what's popular, what the public you know, persona is that is thrust upon us. But instead, we are interested in seeing what God wants us to see. How we can make good on those talents which are entrusted to us. How we can be righteous men and women who raise up courage to shine the light in a world that doesn't want to see the light. And so we look here and we find that freedom. And we also find that clarity of the mind. And we look particularly at verse 5 there in Mark 2. It says that Jesus saw their faith. Meaning it was the faith of the friends that caught Jesus' attention. Not the faith of the paralyzed man himself. Now, there's a lot of sermons that can be had on that discussion. But for now, I want us to look at that idea. That Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the friends. And I want us to consider that in the context of the parable of the talents, where servants are entrusted with talents that they might be faithful with them. What we see here in this text is that there are four men who had a paralyzed neighbor entrusted to them by the mysterious circumstances of life. And what I mean by that is we don't get to choose when we live, what place we're born in, and what people are on earth at the same time when we're on earth. And There's just an innate calling that we have, an an innate responsibility placed on us, being a son of Adam, a daughter of Eve, to make good on just the circumstances in which we're born. Well, for these four men, they had a paralyzed man as their neighbor. And now a lot of people, they'll, they'll step away from that and they'll say, well, you know, maybe he's not in my family. You know, it's beyond my power to do anything. But these men do something different. You see, being a neighbor with this crippled man was their lot in life. 
And in their nobility, they sought to be faithful with the talent of responsibility that was entrusted to them. And the master saw that they had been faithful, and he rewarded them graciously. These four men, they were allowed to enter into the joy of their master because they were faithful with the talent entrusted to them by nothing more than birth circumstances. Now, an interesting thing about this is oftentimes we, we want something from the Lord. We'll say, well, I need to take this to the Lord in prayer. And generally, our understanding of the world is that God's purpose, the goodness in life, is to avoid suffering, to bring some sort of safety. But that's not actually God's motive. And when we look here in the gospel, we can clearly see Jesus did not come to avoid suffering. And the call of God, it is something very different than just mere pain avoidance. It is something which is noble and honorable. And it takes us through those dark valleys so that we might have great courage of conviction and shine the light in the world, which is oftentimes so dismissive of truth. And what we see here is a few good men who are noble in the talent entrusted to them. Often we want God to give us something when in truth God is trying to give us responsibility, an opportunity for manual labor, a difficult task, a difficult journey to get up and leave the house of your ancestors and move to somewhere you've never seen before. Sometimes it's just sticking there where you were born, making good on those around you. Being the good Samaritan who sees the man in the ditch and you're more concerned with that than you are, say, banning plastic straws or whatever it is that the world wants you to be focused on. Focusing on the talents which we actually have is the key to revival. It all was not easy for these men, for the hand of fate had dealt them an impossible burden. Intending to their paralyzed friend, they could do so much and then no more. Quite often the world does this. It steps to us, planting a flag and declaration that we can go so far and then no further. Moreover, we frequently find ourselves up against frustrating evils, unsolvable riddles, affairs which restrain us under the, and the, under the heavy weight of inescapable burden. But despite these wretched tyrannies, Christ came to bring us freedom. Moreover, these few men had the clarity of mind to recognize that Jesus alone was the way to find perfect freedom. And we know this is crucial to the gospel. When we look there in Luke chapter 4, 18 through 19, and again, this is a quotation of Isaiah, Jesus firmly declares that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go flee, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These few men, they carried their neighbor to Jesus out of noble faithfulness to make good on the talent entrusted to them. A talent given to them not by choice, but by charge. And in response, Jesus indeed set the captives free. He gave recovery of sight to the blind. And it's important to understand that this is not by choice, but by charge. These men, they did not choose to be born in the time or place when and where they were, but yet it happened. Being a neighbor with this man was their lot in life. It was the hand dealt to them. Now, a lot of people can justify just ignoring that, walking away from it. Sometimes people would rather go out and speak about being the neighbor to the crippled man rather than actually doing something about it. Oftentimes, the talents that the Lord gives us are opportunities for hard work. The manual labor of picking up an adult male, carrying him up a building, and then digging a hole in that roof and lowering him down. And in our moment right now, there's a lot of talk going on about conspiracy theories. For thousands of years, people rejected both the resurrection and authority of Jesus as nothing more than a conspiracy theory. And to truly declare that Christ is Lord will turn the world against you, causing them to slander you and brand you with petty accusations. But do not let this discourage you, for it is better to walk in the truth and be rejected by the world than to be loved by the world and rejected before heaven. And why that is so important to this text is these men can only see the unique pathway of tearing open a hole in the roof, carrying a man up on a roof. They can only be that creative if they're not thinking on worldly terms. If they're not listening to the justifications of the world to say they did their best. If they are actually looking at Jesus and realizing he is more than just a great philosopher. He's someone that has more than just some really inspiring creeds and some wonderful tones of affirmation. When they see that he is actually 
the Savior, the Messiah, the one who is the very word of God, whose mysterious power binds all of creation together. When they see that, they recognize that at all costs, they must come to him, regardless of how crazy it may sound. And what the friends are doing here is unconventional, but nonetheless, it is sane. In fact, what they are doing is far more rational than the sophisticated games being played by the scribes who seek to discredit Jesus. And when we look to the letter of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 13 through 14, it reads, For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And although the men in this passage, they lived long before the writing of the letter to the Galatians, their faith made this gospel truth known to them. We do not get to choose when we live or what other people are here on earth with us. However, when we are faithful to love them, Christ's liberty flows through us. And we must appreciate the fact that all of our lives are an opportunity to achieve good things out of service to God. And I know I've talked about this quite a bit, but I want to return to this novel um, revelation I've had from dogs. Of course, I have two dogs. I have a blue healer named Count, and then I have a kind of long-haired chihuahua little dog named Baron. And one of the remarkable things about dogs, and if, if you have dogs, you'll know just how true this is, is dogs have an unwavering desire to be with their master. Where they're doing arresting, the noble companions have so great a want to be with their masters that it puts them in complete turmoil to see the master leave. Physical, psychological, it just puts the dog in entire physiological turmoil to see their master go away. And strangely enough, this loyalty of man's best friend shows us something about our own fallen insanity. You see, dogs, while they're not the unique creature made in the image of God, they still have God's fingerprints on them. They still have a lot of God's design running all throughout their veins, even if they're not chiefly made in his image. And among the things that God, that God has placed in dogs and dogs innately know is they have a sane understanding of what is good. They're rational in a sense that they can actually understand what is good. Now, they can't reason with sort of the will that we have as people, but they do have a very basic sanity that says being with the master is good and there is goodness in the presence of the master. Now, for we who are sons of Adam and daughters of Eve in our sinful depravity, we are crippled by an insanity that wants to reject the good. We are afflicted by a disloyal attitude that wants to rebel against the master and turn away from him. And if we're not careful, when we look there at Mark 2, if we read through this passage too lightly, we might discount the novelty of someone being lowered through the roof. When I preached this sermon last Sunday from the pulpit, there were several young men who were there in the church with me, and the day before, we had gone over to a, another member in the church's house and helped her with some things around her property. We'd been up taking things off the roof and just done miscellaneous yard work. And these four young men, they were in there with, with church, and then there were some older men in there, and I said, imagine if, rather than the four of us going over there to do yard work, we went over to, to someone's house, and for whatever reason, we couldn't go inside. And we decided that the best solution we had was to take another man, an adult, full-grown male, who's, again, not small, and we decided we were going to carry him up on top of the roof and then open ourselves up a hole. And yes, you can have all your commentaries on, well, the roof may have been added out of this or that, and maybe it wasn't a big deal to open up. But regardless, if you see people opening up a hole in a roof, which is obviously not a doorway, there's something unusual about this. This is not your normal behavior. It might even look quite suspicious if you've seen people doing this. And also, carrying around another person is no small task. Even if there's four of you, it's something which has to be done with, you know, some care, and it also is something which is a little bit burdensome. It's not an ordinary thing. I don't want us to go too quickly through this account of the gospel and just read it and say, oh, well, you know, they, they had to do this because their doorway was covered or something. This is not something which is conventional, and neither is it something which is ordinary. This is neither a conventional nor ordinary affair. Many people, when they saw the crowd, they would go back home. They might quell their ambitions with thoughts of, I did my best. 
Others might say to themselves, I didn't ask to be neighbors with the paralyzed man, and besides, it's beyond my power to do anything. I'll give him some alm on my way to work or something like that. You know, I, I'll do my best. I can't really help him. I didn't ask to be here. What is it to do with me? There are all sorts of worldly justifications we can have that cause us to sit idle and lack the creativity that these men had. They really do have something which is very creative, and they're seeing clearly, they're thinking in a way that's not by the conventions of the world, and I can't drive that home hard enough. These inspired men were not thinking on ordinary terms of the world. They had a severe impulse which cut deep into their souls, and it drove them to pursue the master at all cost. They set aside all of the worldly justifications which can have us sit idle with the talents charged to us by the mere fact of living. There are things put in our care by the mere fact of living, and God wants us to make good on them. We were born for a time such as this. As frustrating as the world might be when you look around it, remember that you have been put here. God has a purpose for you. You are here for a time such as this. You're not asked to solve all the problems of the world. You're asked to make good on the talents which God has entrusted to you. And when you do that, you will do more to actually change all of the earth than it will when you just pine away at home wanting to ban plastic straws and restructure society or something like that. And just to give a little bit of an insight on how much one little detail really does change things, there's a lot of stuff that happened in the life of the church last week. And one of the very last things that happened was Friday, during the middle of the day, we had grilled hamburgers, myself and a few others who came over to the church, and then Friday night we were having a movie night. Well, when about 4 p.m. came, I went out to get things ready for the movie night, and I went out to start the grill, and I realized somebody had stole the propane tank. Now, how our church is set up, we have a nice back lot, and there's a lot of places that you can't see from the road that's on the back side of the church. And the grill is something which is not even always out. We usually keep it locked up in a shed. Well, in between the time of me using the grill at lunch and evening, somebody came out there and stole the propane. And while that might seem like a mild inconvenience, and yes, I called up different people and somebody brought a propane tank with them, it did set us back a few minutes. And then, over the next few days, I had another reason to use the grill Monday, and I had to go get a, another propane tank. I tried to pick up one here from my house. I ended up breaking some of the plastic in my car where it rolled over there and hit something in the trunk. When I got over there to the church, I put it in there, and even though it appeared to be full and heavy, the propane it never would really work. And even though I was trying to grill, the grill never got hot and ended up having to use a George Foreman and it kind of put our dinner that we were having Monday on hold. And the point of this is a small sin. Somebody saying, oh, well, it's a church. I'll just take the propane tank. It's not going to have that big of an impact. It actually throws a huge wrench in all sorts of things on a wide spectrum of things. The small details matter. And that's the point that I'm trying to drive home. In the same way that someone's small sin of stealing a propane tank can ruin, you know, several upcoming things, one of the things which is also true is when we are faithful in the small things, that has a ripple effect as well. Luke 16.10 says, Those who are faithful in a little are faithful in much. Those who are wicked in a little are wicked in much. When we are faithful in the little things, that actually does more to change the world on the large scale than when we focus on those big things. And true liberty, if we want to bring that to our world, it is found whenever there is freedom from the tyranny of inescapable burden. And that comes through Christ alone. Those who took the paralyzed man to Jesus had a clear mind that understood the goodness of the Master. They understood that the path to such goodness required great effort. It wasn't just about getting out there and virtue signaling and proclaiming what you wish to happen or something like that or airing your grievance or even getting a lot of attention from the world. It was about the four of you getting together with your paralyzed neighbor and hand delivering him to the master. And let us not be confused here. Even though they do a physical act of lowering him down to Jesus, their aspirations are moving upward. They're moving upwards towards the throne of heaven. And now the world, it'll get angry at you if you seek to think freely and sanely with Christ. 1 Peter 4.4 4 states, In all this, 
they are surprised that you do not want to run with them in the same excesses of debauchery, and they slander you. And what that verse reminds us is that the world wants you to think like it. It wants you to go along with its popular narrative, the prevailing explanations. It wants you to go along with everything the peer pressure is setting on your shoulders. But that is insane. The rational thing to do is actually start from the premise that we're all sinners. We need the power of God to sanctify us. Only through the Holy Spirit do we find sanctification. And people are made wicked not by institutions, not by systems of the world. People are wicked because of the sin nature, which is within all of us. When you start from that premise, you're not a conspiracy theorist for thinking the whole world is lying to you. You're actually being rational. Because God alone sanctifies us, not expertise, not years of experience, not an education that takes us to a place where we've got all these letters behind our names, not even being ordained in a church makes you sanctified. Christ alone does. The power of the Holy Spirit, God the Father, revealing his will so that you can walk in it. God wants us to be transformed and liberated in our minds. And when we serve God, the world is going to get angry at us because it wants us to run with it in its excess of debauchery. The world wants you to be insane with it, but take joy in having your mind transformed by Christ. Despite all the wicked foolery of the world, God wants us to have that freedom. And when we serve God and we set our eyes on Him, we can see clearly whilst the world is a jumbled mess of chaos. And even if the whole world is a jumbled mess of chaos, you will have joy when you see clearly. We'll see clearly how to navigate towards goodness and truth if only our minds can be focused on the way, the truth, and the life. And this gospel passage, it is about the goodness that comes when the faith of our hearts is pointed towards that perfect faithfulness of Christ. The friends of this paralyzed man, they were faithful with their talent. Jesus rewarded them for their honorable service. They knew who they were, they knew what they were to do, and they knew why they were here. They were not all distracted by the worldly thinking around them. Instead, the four of them saw clearly. And let us be assured in this fact. God's attention is not negligent. It does not escape God's focus when we are faithful with the opportunities we have in life. Mark's recording of this healing is focused on showing us how important it is to be faithful in our love for our neighbors. And it reminds us that when we use our lives as opportunities to serve Christ, we will find freedom. So we ask ourselves, how can we be effective in opening the eyes of others to the broader and truer perspective which brings about goodness in our world? How do we invigorate others? That courage might be raised to advance and defend all that is good, true, and beautiful. How do we awaken the eyes of our neighbor so that they might not merely survive, but actually live in the fullness for which God has made us? We do this by conforming our character to that of Christ. And with that, let's close by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. This is the Nazarene Stream Preacher and Kingdom of the Logos. We've got a lot of different titles for the different sort of programs we send out, but check us out. We're on Facebook for now, YouTube, and also Rumble where you can look up just the Nazarene Stream Preacher, and that'll find all of our content on Rumble. So, God love you. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can send me an email at jeffdillonproctor at gmail.com, and I'd love to hear from you. God love you, and have a blessed day.